build a compromise resilient CI/CD pipeline. Tashan Kupasam of Datadog will show us how they developed the industry's first end-to-end -end verified pipeline that automatically builds integrations with a Datadog agent. Let's look. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Trishan Karthikupsami. I'm a staff security engineer at Datadog, where I work on things like how to build a compromised resilient CI CD, which uh, hopefully will make sense in a few minutes. So let me set some background, some context, some motivation for this. Why are we talking about this? So Datadog, as some of you might know, is, uh, is an end-to-end -end observability, uh, observability platform for your organization. Um, spans all the way from your network, infrastructure, all the way to your application and services, ultimately to your end users, right? And so when something goes wrong, let's say there's a latency problem, for example, your DevOps, your security, and your business now can all use the same tool to diagnose exactly what went wrong and fix it on the spot, right? And so the agent is this piece of software that you typically install in your uh, containers and hosts to gather metrics about your services. And you can think of integrations as plugins or add-ons that add superpowers to the agent, as it were, uh, lets it observe even more. So for example, one of our favorite integrations in Git is GitLab. We're hoping uh, you're using both today. And so what happened was that um, a year or two ago, we had this problem where we wanted to decouple the um, integrations, the release of the integrations from the agent, because the way we typically release them was every six weeks together with the agent. Uh, as you can imagine, this proved uh, problematic. So for example, uh, what if we wanted to beta test new versions of integrations with our customers? We couldn't do that so easily. So we wanted to decouple them. And of course, the state of the art for doing this is to use something called CI-CD. Uh, one of the most famous examples being GitLab, which has done a wonderful job with pipelines and so on. And so, to, as I like to joke, so now you use this uh, robot sitting in a cloud in the sky. It's got access to your code signing key. So every time your developers check in code, this robot takes out a key, builds the package, right? And, and signs it and, and puts back the key and releases your software. Wonderful. So you have on demand, you have DevOps now, basically, right? Which is great. And there are also good security reasons for doing this, actually. You'd rather have a single point of auditability and logging where you know who's using the key when, right? So for example, a robot, as opposed to a distributed team of de developers. So great, that's the state of the art, CI CD, which is very good. Um, so let's talk about what can go wrong. Uh, because this is a security talk, after all. We have to be optimistic here. Um, in good times, 99.9999% whatever percent of the time, everything is good. Nothing goes wrong. Life is good. The problem is, is when any of these pieces get um, compromised. So, for example, imagine someone uh, runs away with the developer signing key, perhaps to sign Git commits, for example. Or uh, your GitLab repository, for example, gets compromised. So someone tampers with the source code. Or uh, let's say your GitLab pipeline gets compromised, right? Uh, the, the, the runners, for example. Or the container registry used to pull images, uh, used to run the GitLab jobs. Or when your key or file servers get compromised. I, mean, I think you get the idea. I'm sort of belaboring the point here. Uh, the point is that there are many pieces that can go wrong. And the thing is that it's sort of a gray swan. It's not even a black swan problem. A black swan is an unknown unknown. This is a known unknown. It's not a question of if you will get compromised, it's a question of when, and you want to be prepared for it. Because like I said, 99.999% of the time, nothing goes wrong, life is good. But at rare event that happens, it's negative infinity, that's the outcome. And so the state of the art is we have uh, DevOps, which is great, but we're missing DevSecOps here. Let's talk about how to fix that. So let me try to convince you that this is not merely some sort of a Hollywood, bad hacker, sci-fi kind of movie kind of scenario. This is actually problems that have happened in the real world, right? Let's take a look at three horror stories. One, as you might recall, is the flame malware from 2012, not too long ago. Uh, what happened was that someone, many suspect it's a nation state attacker, uh, pretended to be Microsoft. They wanted to get to Iran, you see, to dismantle their, their nuclear program. And what they did was 
a break, uh, unfortunately, a poor hashing algorithm called MD5 that was used back then, it had theoretical weaknesses. But these attackers, whoever they were, found a novel cryptographic attack on, 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 on MD5 that even academics had not seen before. Okay, and so they produced a fake certificate that looked like it came from Microsoft and propagated this updates all the way to Iran, where it caused the centrifuges, centrifuges to every once in a while very subtly mess up. So imagine this is a very high, very sophisticated attacker. And depending on who you ask, this was a good or a bad thing, right? We're, we're not playing with amateurs here, certainly. Uh, scary story number two, more recently, uh, CCleaner, which is a popular Windows uh, cleanup tool. Um, I remember using it as a young man myself many decades ago. Uh, while they were busy being acquired by Avast, the uh, security company, famous for making antivirus software, for example. Uh, while this acquisition was happening, unbeknownst to both of them, someone had compromised their build infrastructure and used it to build malicious code that was then sneaked into CCleaner. Uh, millions of download, but they were interested in 11 or so particular companies, one of whom leads to a scary story number three seems to have been ASUS because they got their own software updates backed out later. And the suspicion is that they got to ASUS by poisoning the well, CCleaner well, and then they made their way to ASUS. So we're not playing in amateurs. We're playing with very serious uh, professionals, nation state attackers even, who are interested in breaking into your CI CD pipeline. It's something you should think about very seriously. And so as a response, some might say, well, why not just use GPG or TLS, right? Wouldn't that solve the problem? No, remember, we're talking about nation state level attackers. They're not gonna be phased by a single key used to sign everything uh, kept on your infrastructure. So this is like the equivalent of keeping the keys to your house under the carpet. Um, it's not going to buy you uh, the security that we're looking for here, unfortunately. Uh, the, the property that we want is something that we call compromised resilience. What does that mean? Well, imagine if you were a medieval age king and someone told you, hey, we know that people breaking into fortresses is a problem. I hear it's a very common problem these days. So, but don't worry, we got the solution. We'll build you an impenetrable fortress. And so as a king, you should be very suspicious to it's a snake oil salesman. There's no such thing. I know there isn't. Or it will be prohibitively expensive. The point is that you cannot prevent the compromise, right? Because if that's invisible, if not outright impossible. What you can do is to mitigate the impact of a compromise. So you build defense of death and security. You have multiple layers so that attackers, you have, for example, a moat surrounded with alligators and flamethrowers and whatnot, and you get the idea. Point is attackers look from far away and say, you know what, I got better things to do with my time. I'm gonna move on to another target. So that's basically compromised resilience in a nutshell. And so how do we do this? Well, we're gonna propose using two pieces of software, two pieces of technology called uh, Intoto and Tough that I claim gets you this property. Um, there's this joke, I don't know how many, how many of you have seen this uh, vitamin water ad? It's, it's 4 a.m. Do you know where your vitamins are? So uh, I've twisted this joke uh, for my own nefarious purposes to say it's 4 a.m. Do you know where your CICD is? But all jokes aside, imagine someone pages you at 4 a.m. and says, you know what? It looks like a pipeline released something malicious. Do you know what happened? Um, let me tell you a story. So I used to be a developer in a software company, one of the very few that had the privilege of being audited by the um, FDA. Do you know why? is because we made software for uh, Big Pharma to run clinical trials. You can imagine very serious business. So we needed to have the ability where auditors could walk in, say, I don't know, randomly 10 years later, 10 years to releasing a version of software, and they would say, <coughs> show me the output of your unit and integration test. Show me, prove to me that your software did what you claim it did back then. Right? And we want sort of the same sort of auditability. We want the same sort of compliance. For some of you, this may even be a compliance requirement. So you can think of a CI CD like this. X is the source code that your developer produces. And your CI CD is basically uh, applying a function F uh, to, uh, to X, your source code, and produces the package Y. And what you want is the, uh, is the property that uh, when you download and install a package, before you install it, you say, does Y equals F of X? Is it the correct uh, X, the source code? Is it the correct application, correct packaging of the source code into the package I'm looking at right now? All right, so that's the basic idea. And how do you do this? Well, one piece of the puzzle is in Toto, which uh, secures uh, the distribution of your source code 
uh, packaging it in your pipeline, right? So all the way between the developers and your and your CI CD. And tough is the is the tool that solves the other half of the problem, which is the, the secure distribution of your packages from your package repository to your end users. And you put the two together, I claim you get this property called end-to-end -end security, which lets you detect attacks anywhere between your developers and end users. So let's take a look at how that works. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all of the gory technical details, but here's what you need to know. We know that the problem exists. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are tools that you can use today to fix the problem. They're called Intoto and Tough, and that's all you need to know. Intoto and Tough gets you compromised resilient. Okay, so let's talk about the first piece of the puzzle, Intoto, which, uh, re uh, remember, solves the problem of uh, detecting attacks anyway between a developer and your CI CD. The, the problem that in Toto solves is kind of a nice metaphor is the game of telephone that kids like to play. So imagine uh, transmitting a source code to your CI CD all the way to your end users, for example, sort of like playing the game of telephone that kids like to play. Used to be fashionable, I guess. I don't know whether they play it anymore. But um, imagine that attackers uh, got in between these kids and tampered the messages. That's sort of how in Toto works. In Toto tries to guarantee the authenticity and integrity of these messages while it's being passed. So, for, for example, the first kid here says ease, and then the second kid, slowly the message, sources of noise, which you can think of as attacks. And uh, unfortunately, fleas get delivered to your end users, which is a bad idea when you wanted to deliver peace. So let's try to fix that problem. How do we do this? Well, the basic idea is to define the software supply chain, right? You remember the f of x problem. This is basically what you're doing. You're saying, this is my f of x. Here's what my f of x may look like. So Alice, who's the administrator, may say, my supply chain looks like this. It consists of two steps, where Diana is allowed to write source code, and she produces a sign at a station saying, I promise I produce foo.py with this hash. And the second step is Bob, who's allowed to package the source code that Alice wrote, and Bob says, I swear I got foo.py with this hash, and I produced a package, star.gz, I simply you know, compress the file and, and serve the users. And I produce the tar.gz with this hash. Great. Now what happens when it, uh, and users, uh, before they install any package, they first inspect it. And all of this is done transparently using another robot, basically taking care of behind the scenes for you using uh, software libraries. What happens behind the scenes is that Alice can say, look, before you install a package, make sure you get the sign attestations from both Diana and Bob, and of course the supply chain itself from Alice, and check that all the rules that, that f of x is indeed the case. So for example, here we say that inspection is you untar the, the foo.tar.gz, make sure that first of all, the tar.gz is correct, what, what Bob produced, and then you untar the file and say, okay, foo.py was the one that Alice produced, and there's no attack in between. See, so no one other than Alice can uh, right, uh, can tamper with the source code. Okay, and so that's how that's how you get uh, supply chain integrity. Now let's talk about the second piece of the puzzle, which is the update framework, or TELF for short. And that solves the problem of the so-called last mile distribution, which is the distribution of this build source code to your end users. And the metaphor, the problem that TELF solves, you can roughly think of it like this. So uh, I don't know if you remember, but back in the 80s or 90s, uh, there was a terrible, terrible attack um, in pharmacies where someone malicious, obviously, went around and, and, and deliberately tampered with uh, medical drugs, people's medical drugs. And unfortunately, a few people were poisoned, and I believe they even actually died, unfortunately. So you can think of tough. What it does is, so in total is the thing that tells you, hey, my software is a list of ingredients, so Diana, produce this ingredient with this dose, and Bob produced that ingredient with this dose, and the whole medical drug is composed like this. That dose did dose, and you mix it together, put in a nice little pill. Tough is the software layer that says, why should you trust this medical drug in the first place? You see, that's the, it's like the seal of freshness, of authenticity, and the hologram sticker that says, yep, FDA approved, good to go. Uh, nothing has been tampered with. That's the rough idea. And so it, uh, I don't have time to go into details, but basically uses design principles that, believe me, your grandma would have told you as a kid. I don't know about your grandma, but my gra grandma told me, if you ever need to launch a nuclear weapon someday, son, make sure you use the two-man rule, which is actually the case. What the US military does, for example, is that you actually have physical separation, where not only are two keys required, but the same person cannot, cannot turn the, 
uh, two keys together. You literally need two different people. Uh, same idea, we have threshold signatures here. Uh, so we also use design principles. Grandma told me, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So that's why you see multiple eggs all over the place here. Um, grandma also said, make sure you use cryptographic agility. And that's the story of the Hydra. So, so for example, remember the flame malware attack that happened because unfortunately you used one weak uh, hashing algorithm called MD5. In TUF, we use multiple hashing algorithms with different designs. So SHA-2 and SHA-3, for example. So unless you can break them both, uh, you, you're not gonna be able to break the, uh, the security system. So anyway, you put all this nice uh, design principles that grandma told you, and we actually designed this in collaboration with Tor who wanted to obviously protect the software updates uh, from people as powerful as nation state attackers. Okay, enough theory, let's talk about practice. How do we actually apply Tough and Intoto uh, in practice for the Datadoc agent integrations? Remember, it was the original problem we were trying to solve. And I claim that putting the two together, you get end-to-end -end security. Okay, so here's what our software supply chain looked like. Earlier, we looked at a demo. Let's, took a look, let's take a look at a real life example. <clears throat> So our software supply chain's got three steps. The first one is called DAG, as in like git DAG, where uh, developers use UPG keys sitting on your UB keys and trusted hardware. So you, 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 you can't even export the keys. Um, so they signed a sign at the station saying, yep, I produced this source code with this, uh, this hash and I'm chucking it into, into our Git repository. Great. Now a CI CD is broken into two steps where it says, you know, I swear I got this Python source code from the Git repository and I'm packaging it into a Python wheel, which is simply a zip file. You can think of it as star.gz basically. Uh, and it packages the, the Python source code into the zip file. And then we have a third step called wheel signer, which basically takes this packages and in total metadata, puts it together in this tough seal of freshness and authenticity and integrity and distributes it in a nice coherent package to end users. And our, when, when our end users uh, install this, um, they have no idea that all the stuff in total verification actually happens behind the scenes. Uh, what happens behind the scenes is that we tell the agent, hey, look, um, first make sure that the wheel was produced by the wheel signer, great. And then unzip it to make sure that the source code was signed by our developers. So you can see that unless you get developer signatures, even if you break into our CI CD, developer keys, sorry. If you break into our CI CD, you won't be able to forge developer signatures, which is where we get the end-to-end uh, -end security from. Okay, and then we add tough. I know the picture looks complicated, but really it's simpler than it looks like. Uh, basically, we're solving three problems here. What we're using tough is to say, first of all, we, we deliver one, there are many keys to the entire system, including uh, distributing developer keys. Think about it. How do you safely distribute the developer keys, the software supply chain? That's what we use tough for. So one root key that we distribute with the agent, and then you can change transparently, rotate the keys in the rest of the system, and the end users wouldn't even know. We know because we've actually done it several times now. Um, and so what we use tough for is to distribute the software supply chain in a compromised resilient way. So just because someone breaks into a pipeline, they won't be able to rewrite the supply chain. They won't be able to rewrite the public keys used to verify the supply chain. And even though they're a machine and those are the things colored in red signing some things, they're not signing the crucial bits. They won't be able to mess with developer signatures without being caught. That's, that's all you need to know. That's the level of detail you need to care about. If you're interested in more gory technical details, uh, please visit this, this link here. <clears throat> okay, so what does all that gobbledygook get us? Let's see. Well, when nothing has gone wrong, clearly nothing, but I think it's important to also point out that um, your end users actually, our end users actually don't see any difference uh, with or without Tuffin and Dota, which is to say that we add very little uh, performance or network uh, overhead uh, to the security system. Right? So most of the complicated, the, 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 the setup, the price of the setup is in one time setup of the whole thing. And then the system basically pretty much maintains itself after that. Okay, well, let's see where the, where the real beauty of the system lies. Um, one is, okay, so if our developer keys are compromised, yes, theoretically what can happen is that uh, attackers can release malicious code. But remember the compromised resilient uh, property I was talking about earlier, like the medieval fortification. We believe we've set the bar so high that this is actually more a theoretical than a practical risk. Let me explain why. First of all, our developer signing keys are trapped on UB keys. Uh, for, we generate them on the hardware. We never export them. We are unable to export them. And um, so you, unless you physically attack one of our developers, 
um, sorry, please don't do that. Uh, you won't be able to get the you won't be able to get the keys. Okay, that's the point. You you can't remotely run away with the keys. And the second thing is that we require uh, you to touch your YubiKey every time you do a signing operation. So even if there's malware sitting in a, on our developers' laptops saying, hey, you should sign me, our developers would say, wait a minute, what's going on? I'm not signing anything right now. This is fishy. Um, <clears throat> and the third thing that we could do, but we've not done for the sake of usability right now, is require at least two different developers to sign up on the same source code. Right? This is so that the developers can more easily release source code, but you can see how it can easily increase the security of the system without, without actually hampering usability too much. So uh, in practice, our developer keys are very, very unlikely to get compromised. And the, the beauty of the system comes through the rest of the way, actually. So what happens when our uh, GitHub repository, in this case, but it could be GitLab, uh, gets compromised? Nothing. We don't lose sleep. In fact, we've seen accidental DOS attacks where uh, developers uh, 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 sign uh, uh, mismatching versions. Basically, what, what, what the GitLab pulls doesn't match what, what a developer signed due to uh, not, not merging branches properly. And so it looks like an attack, but it isn't. So it turns out to be very, very good tests of this thing in practice. And um, uh, the point is that even if our Git repository gets compromised, we don't lose sleep because the attacks won't be able to propagate. Basically, the downloader would block it, as you see here. Uh, what happens if a GitLab gets compromised? Same thing. We don't lose sleep. What happens if a container image registry that GitLab uses get compromised? Same thing. Don't lose sleep. Uh, what happens if our key servers or file servers get compromised? Same thing. You get the idea. The point is that a download is tran uh, transparently on behalf of our agent, verifies this stuff in Dodo metadata, and the moment it smells the slightest suspicion of an attack, basically denies installation of the package. And I should mention, I should take the pain to mention that as far as we know, this is the first in the industry. We haven't seen any public discussion of any similar system. This is the first compromised resilient, at least the, public, the first publicly discussed compromised resilient CI CD that we have seen, right? And there's no, note that there's no trusted hardware here except for YubiKeys. The, the, the cloud is perfectly untrusted. You don't need trusted hardware such as Intel SGX and uh, similarly complicated trusted enclaves, which have their own security bugs these days. Right? All you need is something like YubiKeys. In fact, you don't even strictly need it. And, and you have this very high level of security. So, so the point is, uh, as I said earlier, the bottom line is there is a problem, yes, which is the state-of-the-art uh, CI CD practices. Unfortunately, typically, we don't build compromised resilient CI CD. That's the problem. But the good news is there's two pieces of technology, open source technology, uh, both of which are on the CNCF, which you can use today to secure your own GitLab pipelines, and they're called Intoto and Top. Gives you end-to-end -end security anywhere between your developers and users. Um, I should uh, mention, should take some time to mention that all of this work wouldn't have been possible without some great people at Datadog, NYU, and VMware. And I don't have the time to personally um, shout out to each of you, but you know who you are. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.